We have um, two superstars with us today um, who are going to um, talk, us, talk to us about their research. And, um, and I, I'm talking real superstars here today, the, the best that Samri can offer. And, um, but before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on Ghana land and acknowledge elders past and present. And I'd also like to acknowledge all of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait researchers that we have in this building that I'm sitting in at the moment and all of the fabulous work they're doing to improve um, the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait people. So uh, very important, I think, to do that. So um, we have two speakers. Um, we have Maria Margaritis and Garrett Rogers, and we're gonna start with Maria. And, uh, and as I said, uh, Maria is truly one of our superstars. She does fabulous research. Her research impacts on guidelines and most recently, uh, her, in, her research has impacted on some Australian guidelines, which I'm sure she'll talk about. And, um, and she's also recently been elected to the Australian Academy of Science, which is uh, a great achievement. So um, we're very proud of Maria here at SAMRI, and she's going to tell us th about the latest and greatest in perinatal nutrition. So go for it, Maria. Thank you, Steve. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to be here and to share with you some of the um, selected key studies from our um, Centre of Research Excellence in Targeted Nutrition that aims to improve maternal and child health outcomes that we lovingly call the uh, CRE for Nutrition in, uh, for Mothers and Children. Uh, Maria, I'm going to interrupt you right at the beginning, sorry. What I forgot to tell people was if they think of questions, can they put them at the Q, in the Q&A section and then I'll go back to those questions at the end of Maria's talk. Okay, thanks. Sorry, Maria. Yep, no problem at all. So uh, jumping into guidelines. So one of the things around uh, centres of research excellence and the expectation is that we have evidence of translation and we translate our work. So we are very proud of the fact that our uh, Cochrane Review published in 2018, the largest trial in the omega-3 pregnancy space published in the New England Journal of Medicine in uh, 2019, followed up with an analysis in, in 2020, has been rapidly taken up into the uh, clinical practice guidelines for pregnancy care. And we now have an evidence-based recommendation for women who are low in omega-3 to uh, take a supplement to reduce their risk of uh, preterm and early preterm birth. Um, now, the, the trick to translation obviously is how do you identify women that are low in omega-3? Um, and our partnership and work with SA Pathology um, has allowed us to uh, add um, an omega-3 screening test uh, to the maternal serum screening that happens for all uh, pregnant women in the first uh, trimester or, or early second trimester. Um, so we will be launching this in April with, uh, in partnership with SA Pathology, where all women in South Australia could be offered uh, an omega-3 screen as part of a statewide evaluation where we will uh, test the effectiveness of the screening program around uptake adoption but also ultimately link with uh, pregnancy outcome data to hopefully show that we, we do reduce the rates of uh, preterm and early preterm birth in South Australia. Um, one of the first uh, implementation uh, of the omega-3 uh, screening has actually been as part of the Aboriginal Family Birthing Program um, in South Australia and largely linked with the uh, Women's and Children's Health Network. Um, and, and this project is also a health service project um, really targeted, targeted at improving the nutritional care uh, for Aboriginal women uh, who are part of the program. Uh, because we are very aware of the fact that Aboriginal women who give birth in South Australia tend to be younger um, than, than non-Aboriginal women. They already tend to be quite overweight and suffer uh, nutritional inadequacies and deficiencies more commonly. Um, we've developed uh, in partnership with uh, Aboriginal women and, and community 
uh, a series of, of bundles that we lovingly call ABFAB, so the family and baby bundles um, that are culturally appropriate nutrition intensive strategies that are given to women through their pregnancy and during the postpartum period with the, um, uh, the, the need to and the want to increase uh, engagement um, with the health services and uh, to, uh, for these women to also achieve their pre-pregnancy weight uh, during the postpartum period and to improve their success of breastfeeding. Um, the Omega-3 screening in this program has been really well taken up and, and we have found a higher, uh, a higher incidence of low status uh, in, in these women. So we hopefully um, are doing something uh, quite good in terms of the supplementation. Further back uh, in the translational pipeline, um, we have recently started our poppy trial, which is aimed at looking at iodine supplementation uh, in pregnancy and looking at early uh, childhood neurodevelopment. The main reason why we're doing this is Australia and New Zealand have been uh, the only two countries to recommend um, supplementation with iodine over and above the food fortification that happens of our bread making flour. And our original uh, cohort study uh, evaluating this combined strategy did suggest that women with both high and low iodine intakes um, attend it was association with uh, poorer neurodevelopmental outcomes, so cognition and language uh, for the children. So it suggests that we may have overshot the mark for women who already have adequate iodine intakes from food. So this study is really designed to determine whether reducing iodine intake in the standard prenatal supplements for women who have adequate intakes will actually better optimise the cognitive development of children. Um, we'll, we'll be recruiting over um, 750 women. Enrolment has just started um, and we've taken all our COVID learning. So um, a lot of this trial is uh, designed in a decentralised way. Uh, women can actually enter the trial through um, a digital uh, media campaign uh, participate all the way until their child is two years old, at which time they will need to engage with one of the assessment centres for the, the cognitive outcome. Moving on to um, the neonatal side, uh, part of our CRE has also been designed to target and better optimise the uh, nutritional outcomes for preterm babies. Uh, back in September 2018, uh, South Australia was the first to receive uh, a donor human milk from the uh, Australian Red Cross Milk Service um, that we, we had a, a hand in, in helping set up, which is now a national milk service to support and provide donor human milk for babies born less than 32 weeks. Uh, the question we're trying to answer in this trial is whether uh, donor human milk is needed for nutritional support uh, in the babies born 32 to 36 weeks. Um, so a randomised trial evaluating the, the impact of expanding the service to, to these older PREMs. Um, our other, uh, one of our other uh, work, um, it has been the NERO trial. Um, which was focused in 1,200 babies uh, involving 13 centres around Australia, New Zealand and Singapore. Here we were trying to reduce the incidence of bronchopulmonary dysplasia, which is one of the main chronic lung diseases that these uh, babies will suffer. Um, and, and we had hypothesised that uh, higher dose enteral um, omega-3 or N-3 fatty acids would reduce uh, this risk. Uh, unfortunately, we found that there was no difference, but we may actually have increased the risk. Uh, as a result of this publication um, back in, in 2017, uh, also in the New England Journal, uh, the, uh, the, the European trial didn't start. The Canadian trial kept on going, but was stopped early uh, 
uh, and on an interim analysis due to futility and basically they were showing the same thing that that we were showing so that background becomes really important because we've been doing the five-year follow-up of these children and um, the COVID interruption has been uh, incredibly difficult um, uh, for us because of the face-to-face -face contact but our international colleagues uh, and our colleagues around Australia and New Zealand have uh, have basically said that we really do need this five-year follow-up because often in neonatology there is this um, trade-off between the lung and the brain um, and, and our neonatal colleagues are saying we must get these five-year data because if we do see an improvement in cognitive outcome at five years of these really vulnerable children, then that would trump um, the, the BPD outcome and that, that we would need to manage that in some way. Uh, and finally, uh, the OzFITS uh, study, which uh, closed out in the last couple of days. Um, and this is the study that's really been the triumph of COVID for us. Um, this has been a national survey of children under two. Um, why do we focus on the under twos? Because um, they're excluded from all the dietary surveys, um, but it's a really important period of time to understand uh, what nutrition uh, they're getting and what's happening because they, that time lays the foundations for uh, a lot of things uh, physiologically, biochemically, but also the patterns for, uh, for dietary patterns for later life. So in this study, uh, we recruited over a thousand people uh, in, around Australia um, stratified a, a according to um, a geographic location and, um, uh, and, and age range. Uh, and over the next month, we will be completing this survey. So that's, that's been the triumph of COVID. This survey started three, two weeks after the lockdown and will finish um, on the first anniversary. So um, uh, we're proud of the team and uh, proud of all the work. So I will stop there and take some questions. Thanks very much, Maria. And if you could um, stop sharing your screen um, and we could ask people to write questions in the Q&A um, area. Um, I guess I'll, I'll start um, with a couple of questions. So the omega-3 fatty acid testing that you demonstrated on the SA pathology form, obviously that's great for South Australians, but what about in other states? How do people get that testing in other states? Yeah, so um, it, the, we've worked with the uh, National uh, Preterm Birth Alliance. At the moment, it will only be available in South Australia as part of this implementation project. Um, and as we get the bugs out of the system, the hope is that um, uh, it'll be able to be rolled out into other states. Uh, Western Australia and Tasmania have already expressed interest. Uh, the trick as we, we do the implementation will be, or the implementation project, uh, will be to work out the sustainable funding model so it can continue um, uh, beyond the, the research project. So we're looking at um, uh, a number of alternatives uh, to make that sustainable. Um, thanks for that. And if, um, if you give, oh, we have a question. Look, it's come up. Um, so Paula has asked a question. Um, in the OzFITS um, study, what method of dietary assessment did you use? And will you be able to look at different types of sugars? Uh, yes, uh, Paula, we're definitely uh, looking at all sorts of different types of sugars. Um, it was a combined uh, a dietary recall with a food diary. Um, and, uh, a, a random selection uh, had multiple days uh, repeated so that we could do the validation. Um, there's a lot of interest um, in some of the new toddler foods in squeezy packs and things like that. So um, we've collected recipes and, and the added foods and sugars. So yes, yeah, sugars is, is part of that. And 
Perhaps the final question from Stephanie. Do you use oral N3 supplements? If so, did you have any issues with N3 supplements making people feel sick? And is there an alternative? Yeah. Um, we Yes, we definitely uh, used oral supplements um, in, in our... Um, in all of our trials and for people with low status, the recommendation is, is oral supplements um, as capsules uh, rather than, um, than straight fish oil. Um, there haven't been too many um, problems with, um, with illness uh, or feeling sick, um, especially if the supplements are taken with food, um, that tends to, to help hugely. Thank you very much, Maria, and some really impressive work, some great studies published in uh, terrific journals and ha certainly having an impact on people's health. So um, the whole translation gamut, so um, fantastic example of that. So we'll now move on to Geraint, who's going to tell us about the microbiome. And um, Geraint's also um, one of our superstars and also one of our super MRFF grant writers. Um, constantly gets new MRFF grants. Um, don't know actually how he does that, but he seems to be successful at that particular skill. Um, but has really brought to South Australia since he arrived some terrific microbiome expertise and uh, has collaborated with a lot of people in the state. So great to hear from Geraint. Thanks, Steve. Um, I can write MRFF grants, but I can't operate Zoom. So I've now got my uh, talk over here. Um, Hopefully you can see it. Uh, I'm not staring off into space. I am actually looking at it. Um, is it coming through okay? Yeah, it's perfect. Great. Okay, so obviously trying to encapsulate the whole of a, a research program in 10 minutes is, is, a, is a bit of a challenge. Uh, I would argue it's particularly challenging for microbiome uh, and host health uh, research because we're really spread across a huge number of different areas. And I'm going to explain why that is and then, and then provide some examples. I'm interested, I'm a microbial pathologist, I'm interested in the microbiome and uh, I'm, I'm interested in the dynamics of the interactions between different microbes uh, and, and how they talk to each other and how these systems work. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm well aware that very few other people are interested in that. Uh, uh, my, my family in particular have given up all pretense of finding it interesting. But what I know that people are interested in is, is the relationship between uh, risk exposures for disease and health outcomes. So for example, why uh, certain people who come into contact with a particular uh, pathogen will have a severe infection and others will have a much milder infection. Or why certain people who have a, particularly diet, a particular dietary exposure uh, will develop metabolic disease and, and others uh, won't. And what we've really come to understand in recent years is that the, the microbiome as a key um, regulator of, of our uh, metabolism and our uh, immune systems uh, plays a major uh, mediatory and uh, modifier role in, in these kind of relationships. And that's important because unlike things like our genetics and, and often things like our diet, it's quite, uh, it, it's much more easy to, to modify the microbiome to try to uh, improve health outcomes. So one of the areas that we're particularly interested in is the health outcomes of, of senior Australians, uh, particularly those living in uh, residential aged care. And uh, we know that uh, there's a huge amount going on in that stage of our lives in terms of changing exposures, uh, our physiology changes, uh, we have exposures to polypharmacy, um, and uh, often our diets change, and we know that our microbiome is changing at the same time. So what we're really trying to do is pick out uh, relationships uh, between these processes that we can then uh, target with, with dietary interventions or, or other types of interventions. And this is quite challenging because of the interrelationships between these different factors. So for example, uh, the, the physiolog physiological changes that come with aging can alter the gut microbiome. That can increase uh, or, or reduce the protection that we get against, against uh, chronic inflammation. That can increase frailty, which in itself can change uh, the way in which we interact with our diets. And that can again, have a flow on effect to the microbiome. So what we really need to do if we want to study these kinds of relationships is, is try to capture data across a whole range of different contexts. And this is an MRFF uh, supported study that we started back in 2018 called GRACE. Um, it really targeted trying to understand antimicrobial resistance dispersion within the aged care setting, which we know is a, is a huge problem. And what we did was we collected uh, 
uh, stool and respiratory samples from a large number uh, of, of people in residential aged care in South Australia, and we subjected it to metagenomic sequencing. We also performed sequencing on environmental samples, uh, and we collected a huge amount of data on dietary exposures and um, uh, polypharmacy and comorbidities, people's engagement with primary health care, facility management, interactions with the wider community, and so on. And what that allows us to do is to examine microbial markers or, or contributors to a range of different processes. So as I said, we're very interested in antimicrobial uh, carriage and dispersion. Um, we're also looking at these data to try to better understand um, cognitive decline and frailty, which we know the microbiome is a major uh, factor in. And, and we're also looking at uh, susceptibility to acute bacterial infections. And of course, all of these factors interrelate. Um, so we can we generate, uh, these are just illustrative, but we can generate complex sequence data, which we can then compare between different contexts, whether it's different residential uh, aged care uh, individuals or uh, different sites within that environment. And then we can look at differences between those samples, and that allows us to link differences with particular exposures and, and, and hypothesize about them. Um, the nature of those relationships and perhaps target them. And this approach really underpins a lot of what we do in microbiome and host health. And these are just some illustrations of other studies that we use a similar template for. So this is a, a study where we looked at um, metabolic health risks in uh, Torres Strait Islander uh, our populations with colleagues uh, Robin McDermott and Sean Taylor um, using a similar approach. We've just finished looking at uh, the uh, transmission of pathogens and antimicrobial resistance between patients in an open plan hospital ward in Myanmar. Um, and, and closer to home, we are looking at determinants of um, health outcomes for uh, patients in ICUs, both at the, the Royal Adelaide uh, and at Flinders Medical Center. So whilst it's a, uh, these are very different contexts, they're, they're built around uh, the same, uh, same kind of analytical chassis. Um, what we're trying, what we're, trying to do then is when we uh, identify these relationships, build um, uh, interventions, and this is a very long way to come around to the subject of the talk, which is supposedly nutrition, I got there eventually. Um, we know uh, from a number of international studies that um, modifying the diet, for instance, in older people who are experiencing frailty can have specific effects on gut microbiology. So particularly things like um, Mediterranean diet, uh, uh, or Mediterranean diets, um, and we know that those changes are significantly associated with uh, improved protection against processes that are associated with uh, frailty and cognitive decline. And, and that really allows us to try to, to develop uh, specific interventions. And we're doing that just at the moment with a, a, a randomized controlled trial that's sponsored by the Hospital Research Foundation um, to try to get this kind of Mediterranean diet intervention into residential aged care. It's previously been trialed in um, people living independently in the community. It's much more of a challenge to do it in an aged care setting. Uh, and um, we think it's quite an exciting uh, uh, microbiome uh, targeted uh, intervention. And what we're trying to do more and more is, is try to uh, mine some, some big data sets to try to help with these kind of uh, intervention study designs. Um, so these, this is a schematic from a, um, a study that was just published in, in Nature Medicine by, by uh, co-authored by a member of our team, uh, Kerry Ivey, who's based in Harvard. And this was a study where they took metagenomic data from, the, from stool and related it uh, to, a, to a huge number of, of, of wider variables, uh, particularly around heart health. Uh, and this, this involved, uh, I think, nearly 70,000 individuals. And what that allowed them to do was to identify relationships between the gut microbiome and uh, specific risk factors for cardiac, poor cardiac health outcomes, and to relate those to microbiome markers. And what that does is allow us to build trials where we, even if this isn't a causal interaction, we have a marker for improvements, which we can then measure within an RCT setting. Um, I'd just like to ask the chair, I've got some more slides, but I'm probably running a, a little bit short of time and they're not on a nutritional area. Shall I, shall I pause there? Um, I think you, you've probably got another couple of minutes, but if you'd okay. like to stop there, that's fine. Well, Maria tells me that all things are nutrition, and nutrition is all things. So strictly speaking, this is still within the nutrition there. I'll maybe just present a, a couple more slides. It was really about 
the program sits within precision medicine and 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 one area that we're really trying to apply this precision approach is in uh, respiratory health and that's that's an area that i've done a lot of work in and in things like asthma traditionally we have a one size fits all approach to therapy a kind of stepwise approach where you ramp up the number of interventions until people respond but we know increasingly that people with asthma have many different inflammatory phenotypes and some of those phenotypes don't respond well so for example people who don't have eosinophilic airway inflammation tend to respond more poorly to inhaled corticosteroids which are really a mainstay of of care and we're trying to develop uh, microbiome analysis into this kind of a precision approach so this was a study that we published in the lancet a few years ago that was looking at as if for as a as a as a, uh, a therapy for severe uncontrolled asthma and there we found that uh, the inflammatory phenotypes didn't really predict response although response was variable and when we looked at the microbiology of the airways, we were able to identify specific markers, in this case, Haemophilus, as predicting response. And we can see that when we look at the, the, the primary outcome of the study, which was reduction of exacerbations, um, the, the more Haemophilus you had in your airways, the, the, the better um, or the greater the, uh, the benefit you got from the study. So this gives us, a, this has been introduced now into guidelines, and this gives us a basis to really identify people who, who might benefit from this study, uh, benefit from this intervention. And we are now trying to expand this beyond just individual diseases. So we know that in many cases, people with different chronic lung diseases have characteristics that if they had a different primary diagnosis would qualify them for therapy, but because of the diagnosis they have, uh, that isn't a therapy that's necessarily offered to them. And what we're doing is trying to move away from those primary diagnostic labels and look at people based on their inflammatory and microbiological profiles, and then use machine learning to identify potential therapies that might work for them. And, and this is uh, based around a large international collaboration we've put together that's led by SAMRI. These are all the, the, the collaborating groups, uh, and it allows us to draw on the huge amounts of data which are stored from clinical trials which have now been completed. Those data are not necessarily being used, and we can bring those together uh, put them into our analytical machinery and, and derive new insight without, without spending any more money, which is always a good thing. And so far, there's around 4,000 patients within that. One thing that I would mention finally is that, as you can see, most of these groups are in Australia or the US or the UK or New Zealand. And this is a real challenge because conditions like asthma are suffered by people across the world, um, but the vast majority of clinical trials focus in, on populations in these countries. And there's a, there's a real equity issue there. And what we're doing now is involved in, in studies with our collaborators in New Zealand that are looking at, for example, children with asthma in Uganda and Ecuador and Brazil, who seem to have a different phenotype, and trying to see if we can revise treatment protocols based on things like the airway microbiome to better suit their needs. And, and this is something that we're also doing in the context of bronchiectasis, where we're trying to understand how we convert the treatment guidelines which have been designed for one particular population with bronchiectasis and use those effectively for another population with bronchiectasis who unfortunately aren't often uh, the subject of uh, or sufficient uh, RCTs. So I'll, I'll finish there. Thanks, Steve. Thanks very much, Garrett. And if you can um, stop sharing your screen um, and any questions, if people can put them in the Q&A slot, that would be fantastic. I might start and um, a couple of those um, papers that you, of yours and others, um, Garen, um, seem to indicate perhaps that the diet plus the microbiome might be more powerful than the impact of genetics on your health outcome. Is that a safe thing to say or are we not quite there yet? Apologies, I was distracted by my inability to stop sharing my screen. Uh, did you ask whether uh, the microbiome <laughs> is more important than genetics? I was saying that diet plus microbiome is more powerful than your genetic makeup in determining your health outcome. Is that a safe thing to say now, or are we still a bit away from that? I, I mean, even, even given the makeup of this meeting, I, I think that I'd shy away from, from saying that. Uh, I mean, what, what really um, is occurring to us more and more is that the, the silos around things like uh, genetics versus diet versus polypharmacy versus the microbiome are unhelpful in these kind of analyses and and really what we're trying to do is 
uh, explain as much of the variance as possible by, by including all of these different sets of, of data into the, into the model. Um, I think that uh, we should certainly not shy away from treating the diet plus uh, the microbiome as being potentially as influential as genetics and, and, and fund it accordingly. Um, but what the relative balance of those influences is, is likely to vary from condition to condition. All right, we have a couple of questions. One's from Julian. Um, and just summarizing, it's quite a long question, but it basically says, is the microbiome actually important in allowing us to process some nutrients from the Mediterranean diet, um, particularly polyphenols? Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. This is something that's been looked into a lot. And uh, we know that many of the, many of the beneficial factors, um, uh, in, including polyphenols and, and short chain fatty acids and, and, and other factors, are not necessarily accessible without the activity of, 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 the, of the microbiome. And that's a real challenge. So for example, in, in, in residential aged care, you have a huge amount of antibiotic exposure um, uh, and uh, because people have infections and that's obviously necessary and important, but what that does is reduce the ability of the microbiome to process things like the Mediterranean diet to derive benefit. So how we balance the Retaining the functionality of the microbiome with uh, ensuring people stay safe is, is a really tough question. I would say that a lot of the data that's emerging suggests that, that they are one and the same thing. And if you can preserve the functionality of the microbiome, it helps in excluding pathogens. So you get, you get both benefits, but clearly a lot more research is needed. Thanks. And the last question, um, again, from Paula. So Paula has participated really well here. So thank you, Paula. Um, we should give her a prize or a bottle of wine or something or some um, blueberries. Um, have you considered looking at the oral microbiome and linking up with researchers in that area, Garen? Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. I, we, we're very interested in that area. Uh, my sort of uh, area of greatest interest is in the respiratory tract. And, and we know that the oropharyngeal microbiome is a real um, mediator of our risk of respiratory disease. And when we look at the oropharyngeal microbiome, it explains m many of the traditional risk factors that we associate with infection, like exposure to smoke and things like that. So it's a, it's a really fascinating area, and it's one that we're, we're quite, it's a space that we're quite active in. All right. I think we're a little bit over time, but I think it's been a, a brilliant session. In fact, we've had um, terrific participation. Um, I think we may have even broken the record, but I'm not sure about that. Um, but obviously very popular, um, uh, and Marie and Garrett have given terrific talks. So thank you for everyone who's participated. Thanks for the questions. And next week, as I understand it, we're talking about COVID-19. So look forward to next week and thank everyone again. Thanks a lot.